Hello, welcome to the Park College uh, Health and Social Care Unit 2, Promoting Health and Wellbeing Screencast, and this is the second screencast on the topic of definitions of health. What we're hoping to do in this screencast is to introduce you to the social model of health, and what we're going to do is go on to examine the evidence of the social model of health, and we're providing some examples of the social model of health um, some up-to-date and modern examples there for you. So what is the social model of health? Well, this is a model that's favoured by sociologists. This model looks at the way that health status varies between people of different social class, gender and ethnic background. By health status, we simply mean an individual's experience of health. But sociologists go further than looking at just individuals. They look at health outcomes of different social groups and they note the patterns of inequality that exist between these groups. Sociologists also examine the reasons for these inequalities and these variations in health status between different groups. In the first part of this screencast we're going to examine health inequalities linked to social class. In the UK, we recognise three main social class groups. Working class, middle class and upper class. Social class has always been linked to health inequalities. And we're going to start off by looking at some historical background. Around the middle of the 19th century, writers and commentators started to express concerns about the appalling conditions that were being experienced by the urban poor, the working class living in the industrialised towns and cities of Britain. In 1845, Frederick Engels published his famous book, The Conditions of the Working Class in England. I'm going to read you an extract of that book, which explains the experiences of people living in um, Whitechapel and Bethnal Green in London. Um, it's interesting to note that at this time, most people, ordinary people, would be classed as working class doing um, unskilled manual work. The most extensive working people's district lies east of the Tower of Whitechapel and Bethnal Green, where the greatest masses of London working people live. Let us hear Mr G Alston, preacher of St Philip's Bethnal Green, on the condition of his parish. He says, It contains 1,400 houses inhabited by 2,795 families, or about 12,000 persons. The space upon which this large population dwells is less than 400 yards, 1,200 feet square. And in this overcrowding, it is nothing unusual to find a man, his wife, four or five children, and sometimes both grandparents, all in one single room, where they eat, sleep and work. And if we make ourselves acquainted with these unfortunates through personal observation, if we watch them at their scanty meal and see them bowed by illness and want of work, we shall find such a mass of helplessness and misery that a nation like ours must blush that these things can be possible. I was rector near Huddersfield during the three years in which the mills were at their worst, but I have never seen such complete helplessness of the poor as since then in Bethnal Green. Not one father of a family in ten in the whole neighbourhood has other clothing than his working suit, and that this is as bad and tattered as possible. Many, indeed, have no other covering for the night than these rags, and no bed save a sack of straw and shavings. And here is another quote um, from Clifford Lyons' book, Companion to the Industrial Revolution. Children of the poor classes worked from a very early age. Conditions in the factories were bad, and the working day was at least 14 hours. Accidents were common, and discipline very strict. Some factories operated the machines day and night, so that one shift of children used the beds vacated by the next shift. It was clear for Engels that the Industrial Revolution actually made things worse for the working class. The people crammed into close quarters, um, the spread of disease was rife, and there was a high death rate from the dangerous conditions of working in factories, mines and mills. 
and these were the conditions that were suffered by the majority of working people in the country. In particular, the people that lived in the industrial towns and cities. And this was in contrast to the minority, the opulent rich, that uh, benefited from the profits made from the industrial economy. Pause the screencast now. Thinking about the holistic approach that we talked about in the last lesson, see if you can apply that to the experiences of the working class poor at the beginning of the 20th century. How might they have suffered physically, intellectually, emotionally, socially and so on? The recognition of these conditions led to campaigns by philanthropists, politicians and other social campaigners, mainly from the left, to try and improve the conditions of uh, the working class. And there was a steady improvement in conditions of health and welfare throughout the early part of the 20th century, which culminated in the formulation of the welfare state after the Second World War. However, inequalities persist and new data suggests health inequalities are worsening between the richest and poorest in the UK. There are a number of official reports that have been published which give evidence of these health inequalities. The Black Report published in 1980 the HSM report in 1997, and these were both commissioned by the UK government to look at patterns of health and illness in the UK. Most recently, there's been a report by the UN's World Health Organisation. So the first report there that I mentioned is the Black Report. This was a government commission survey published in 1980, and it found that there was a continued improvement in health across all social classes during the first 35 years after the National Health Service was formed. So the main reason for this improvement was the formation of the NHS in 1946. Although the Black Report found an improvement across all social classes, they also found correlations between social class and infant mortality rates, life expectancy, and also inequalities in accessing of NHS services. At all ages, lower social classes measured by occupation experience higher mortality rates for almost all causes of death. The Black Report offers four explanations of class inequalities in health. The first of these is the social selection explanation. This is the view that illness is not the result of low income and poverty, but the causes of them. Healthy people are more likely to be upwardly mobile, while those who are ill become downwardly mobile, e.g. because they missed out on school through illness. The next explanation put forward by the Black Report is the artefact explanation. This view states that statistical comparisons between social classes tend to exaggerate the extent of inequality because the working class, the poor health class, is shrinking while the middle class, the good health class, is expanding. The next explanation put forward by the Black Report is the cultural and behavioural explanations. Unequal health stems from differences in the behaviour of people from different classes. Working class people have worse health because they are more likely to engage in health damaging behaviour such as smoking, drinking alcohol etc. Some argue that behavioural differences between the classes result from cultural differences. However, Marmot shows that only a small part of the class gap in mortality is due to health damaging behaviour. The final, and I think uh, most valid approach put forward by the Black Report is the structural and material explanations. Structural and material explanations see inequality and material conditions as the cause of health inequality. These include poverty and material deprivation stemming from unemployment, low income, bad housing conditions, polluted environments and unhealthy or dangerous working conditions. 
Low social position is associated with a lack of control over one's life and with higher levels of stress and thus poor health. So let's have a look at uh, some modern examples. This bar chart shows male life expectancy at birth in a range of countries. You see the average male life expectancy for the UK here is 77 years old. It's interesting to compare this with the US here at 75, although the US is a richer country than the UK. It does not have a national health service. Compare this to Cuba, which is a relatively poor country, which does have a national health service, and you can see that the life expectancy in the US and Cuba are the same. You would expect the life expectancy of Cuba, a relatively small, a poor country, to have a lower life expectancy than the US. What I'd like to draw your attention to is the two figures at either end of the bar chart. Carlton and Lindsay are two areas in Glasgow. Lindsay is an affluent area, whereas Carlton is a deprived area. You can see that there's a massive difference between the average life expectancy of these two areas. You can also see the average life expectancy in Carlton is lower than uh, in India and the Philippines, Lithuania, Poland, etc. And this data comes from the World Health Organization report that I referred to earlier in the screencast. Pause this presentation for a minute and make a list of reasons you think these inequalities persist. Sociologists suggest a number of reasons why those on low incomes have worse health outcomes. First of all, people on low incomes have fewer life chances. These are opportunities to improve quality of life, such as having a holiday away from home, being able to afford to go out to concerts or the cinema and such like, going out for a meal in a restaurant, going to university, running a reliable car and owning your own home. Standards of living is also an issue. Those on low incomes experience poorer health because of lower living standards such as poor housing and a poor diet. Sociologists also point to the power of advertising. Advertising can be very powerful and gives us a false impression of food products which are bad for health. Think of the new McDonald's advert. This could be linked to the rise in obesity in the UK. It's important to note it's not just people on low incomes who are susceptible to advertising, however. An issue for those on low incomes also might be risk of accidents. Those in lower paid, unskilled jobs have a greater risk of accidents at work and can suffer from stress linked to unemployment. Job satisfaction is also an important factor. Those in skilled professional work report greater job satisfaction than those in unskilled manual work. They have more control over their work. How do you think this might affect health? Think about the holistic approach to health that we discussed in the last lesson. Another issue for those on low income seems to be the ability to access care services. The 1997 Aitchison report found that professionals were more likely to access NHS services and they were more likely to be able to successfully demand specialist referrals from doctors therefore taking up more NHS services then than those from poorer backgrounds. The researcher Julian Tudor Hart referred to this as the inverse care law. Can you note down any reasons why you think this is? And if not, this might be one of the interesting questions that you'd like to bring to the lesson. Another important factor is education. 
Professionals are more likely to be better educated and therefore may be more aware of health issues than unskilled workers. You may be able to think of some other reasons that I haven't mentioned in this screencast. Bring them to the lesson if you can. Sociologists have also recognised gender inequalities in health. Women seem to be more aware of health, and they are more likely to go to the doctors. Men are less likely, and as a result, women appear to have higher sickness rates than men. But this may reflect the fact that more male ill health goes unreported. So women live longer than men, but they report more illness. However, because they live longer than men, women are more likely to suffer from chronic illness. This partly explains why two-thirds of the disabled population are women. There are four main explanations of gender differences in health and social care. The first is the biological, cross-cultural explanation. Uh, this evidence indicates that gender differences in mortality are largely biological in, or, in origin. Women live longer than men in most societies. However, social factors do influence mortality rates. For example, women's life expectancy improved more than men during the 20th century because of a dramatic decline in deaths in childbirth. The next explanation, the artefact explanation, um, and in this view, higher mortality rates for women could simply reflect a greater willingness or opportunity to seek help when they have symptoms of illness, and not greater sickness. The cultural explanation. Um, there are two views about the influence of culture. The licence view, which suggests it is more acceptable for women to admit being ill. And the women coping view, which suggests that women are expected to cope with being ill because of their domestic responsibilities. The final explanation is the structural and material explanation. In this explanation, women spend more time at home, which means that bad housing is likely to affect them more. Women are also more likely to suffer poverty, for example as lone parents. Bernard shows that married women and single men have the worst health, including mental health because married women sacrifice their own well-being for their husbands and families. It's also important to note that most health care is provided by women. Informal care in the home, looking after sick children or elderly relatives is generally seen as part of a woman's gender role. And formal care by paid workers is largely women's work too. For example, most NHS employees are female and have a look around the health and social care class. You'll probably see this reflected there as well. The data also shows health differences exist between people from different ethnic groups. So in terms of morbidity, people in black uh, and Indian ethnic groups have higher rates of uh, long-standing illness than, than people from white ethnic groups. With those from Pakistani or Bangladeshi origin having the the highest rates there of morbidity. In terms of mortality, there's a, a higher mortality amongst men and women born in Africa and men born on the Indian subcontinent. Looking at infant mortality, according to government statistics, among mothers who were born in countries outside the UK, it's those from the Caribbean and Pakistani ethnic origin that have infant mortality rates which are about double the national average. Now the term perinatal refers to the fetus um, and um, newborn from five months before to one month after birth. And the perinatal mortality rates, according to the UK government, have been consistently higher for babies of mothers from Caribbean and Pakistani backgrounds that have been born outside the UK. And it's interesting to note that the differences between groups have not decreased over the last 20 years. 
Although these are government explanations, it's important to note that there are problems in comparing the health of different ethnic groups because ethnic categories are difficult to define and because the, F the health chances of an ethnic group tend to reflect its class position. There are three main explanations for ethnic differences in health that are put forward. The first is the genetic explanation. There are links between certain genetic disorders and ethnic origin. For example, sickle cell disease is much more common among people of African ancestry. However, genetic differences between ethnic groups account for only a tiny proportion of all illnesses. The next explanation is the cultural explanation. These explanations focus on cultural norms, values and lifestyles of ethnic groups. For example, heart disease among Asians has been blamed on the use of cooking fats. However, Nettleton criticises explanations that blame minorities for health-damaging behaviour but overlook their healthy practices, such as low consumption of alcohol, tobacco, especially by Asian women. The third explanation is structural and material explanations. Some ethnic minorities, notably Afro-Caribbeans, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis, experience high rates of unemployment, low pay, poor housing and limited educational opportunities. From this point of view, the poorer health of these ethnic groups is not caused by genetic or cultural factors, but reflects their class position and the effects of discrimination. And so to recap... The social model of health looks at the way that health status varies between people of different social classes, gender and ethnic background. It examines the reasons for this, which it argues lies within social and environmental factors rather than genetic or individual explanations. The next topic that we're going to be looking at is factors affecting health and well-being. So thank you for watching this screencast and bring your Cornell notes and at least one interesting question to the next lesson.